um, um, that, you know, that you, you help um, teach your dogs to, um, they teach confidence building, they help um, keep the dog's minds busy, um, they enrich them a little bit, and they just, you know, give them something to do to keep them out of trouble. Um, on the bottom right corner here, we have some more enrichment toys. Those are food stuff toys. Some of them are topples. Those are the fun things in the, at the top, the, the green, orange, and blue. Um, you stuff food in them like you would a Kong, like those cones, and then you can freeze them, and then you can give them their, to your dog for a nice, easy enrichment toy to keep their minds busy and also gives them a nice snack. My dogs each get two topples a day. And while this guest is here, she gets one topple a day instead of two, only because um, she gets most of her calories through training right now. And then on the bottom left corner here, you're seeing a crate full of all sorts of toys and fun things and licky mats and all sorts of fun things. Um, I, I got that present, uh, that present, that picture from my friend who is preparing for a puppy. And it was just so perfect. I asked if I could use it for this presentation. So things that you will need to bring home, to welcome home your brand new furry friend. Um, you'll need a crate. You'll need some baby gates and X-Pens to help keep your dog contained in certain areas of your house, such as the kitchen or the living room, or keep them out of certain areas of the house. For example, if you're primarily going to be upstairs with them, then you can put a baby gate at the top of the stairs to ensure that they don't accidentally fall down the stairs, especially when they are so young and they don't actually have that much depth perception yet. Um, you want to have a variety of toys. Your puppy might not like the toys, like the standard squeaky toys that we all think about. Um, each dog has different tastes. For example, my older girl, she prefers to shred toys. So I get her stuffy toys that she really loves, like those cheap dollar store toys that she can just rip apart and get the squeaker and just kill because that is what she loves to do. Um, my younger dog, he prefers to chew on things. So he gets stuffing list toys um, that have, um, and also toys that like you can put the water bottle into and they crinkle or like paper crinkly toys. He, he prefers those types of toys. Neither one of them really likes those rope toys. They prefer different types of tug toys, so we just do that instead. So you want to have a variety of them so that you can always have something interesting and new for your dog. Different textures, you can have harder rubber toys, you can have nice soft fluffy toys, and this is how you'll find out what your dog likes and also they won't get bored. Um, you want a variety of enrichment activities as we went over in those two pictures up top, um, the top left and the bottom right. Um, those are the type of enrichment activities or one type of enrichment activities. Um, I also enjoy using something called the snuffle mat, which is just, you know, a dish, a dish mat with um, pieces of fleece woven through it so that it all, um, I'm like trying to like show with my hands when you're just seeing the screen. I don't think you can even see me. Um, you might be able to, I don't know. I don't see me. So I don't know if that matters. Um, so the snuffle mat, you can put some food in it. It's got the fleece there. Um, and, it, and it just gives them an opportunity to use their noses to um, search for the food and eat them. Using their nose is really, really, really good enrichment. It's like the number one instinct thing for almost every single dog. And so giving them opportunities to sniff around and forage for their food is like number one. And honestly, can solve like 90% of behavior problems, I'm just saying. Um, other enrichment activities include uh, things that you can shred. Like I said, one of my dogs likes to shred and destroy toys. So she gets, um, we get chewy orders every two weeks and she gets to just demolish the boxes before I throw them out. Um, the bigger boxes go and get recycled, but then anything that comes in a smaller box, like we get cat food, so we get the boxes with the cans, I take the cans, I put them in the cabinet, and then I take the box, I throw some kibble in there, and I let the dog have at it. She loves to shred things. She also shreds my junk mail, so that's a good way for me to get rid of that. Um, you're going to want to have multiple food bowls. Please don't just have one. Um, 
stainless steel or ceramic is preferred over plastic because as your dog is chewing and licking and, and getting into the crevices and um, figuring out their food bowls, they will start to create scratches and there will be dents in these plastic bowls, which then allow for food and bacteria to get stuck in. And I am one who washes my dog bowls after every single meal because I know the potential hazards, but I know most people don't do that, or at least a lot of people don't do that. So you want to make sure that your bowls are going to be as safe and as sanitary as possible. And ceramic and stainless steel happen to be the best, ceramic being the best, in my opinion, for safety and health-wise. Honey, you don't need to growl at anyone. Then you're going to want blankets, beds, and crate pads so that your dog has somewhere comfy to be and something warm to wrap themselves in. Some dogs tend to be bed shredders and don't get beds in their crates, and that's perfectly okay. Um, many dogs do well with just an old ratty towel or a blanket anyway. Um, collars, leashes, yes, multiples. Um, now, I'm a little bit of a collar snob, so if you ever see me out and about, you will see my dogs are impeccably dressed with their lovely leather stud and jeweled, bedazzled collars. Uh, you don't need to go that far, but I do recommend having multiple collars and multiple different types of collars. So like a martingale, which is, um, it, it's a limited slip. It prevents dogs' heads from slipping out of the collar. If they become stabby and can back out of collars, you will want um, flat collars as well. Um, um, you can have them with like a seat belt type buckle, or you can have them like with a belt buckle type buckle. Um, multiple collars are really good. Um, you want to wash your collars often, depending on the material. Like I said, mine are leather, so they, my dogs don't wear collars in the house or anything like that, or while they're crated. So um, there's not really much of a chance for them to really ruin their collars. But if your dogs are wearing fabric or nylon collars, you're going to want to wash them often. We don't often think about that, but we should. It's a really good way for them to... Um, it's a really good place, should I say, for bacteria and moles to grow, especially if you have a dog that likes to get in the water a lot. Um, so collars are really important to wash, have multiples of them, so you always have the ability to have a collar right then and there. Multiple leashes as well. If you are anything like me, you will lose all your leashes, even my nice expensive leather ones, because I don't know what I'm doing with my life half the time. <laughs> and so you'll want to have multiples of them. I keep them in my car, I keep them in my mother's car, and I keep them all over the house. Um, leashes are in no shortage here. Uh, all right, trying to hit this button, there we go. Okay, so your dogs came home, now what? That is a lovely picture, again, of my young Flash. The first day he came home when he met Sansa, um, back when she was young and not so gray. Um, here are some things that you're going to need to consider. Do you already have pets in your home? Um, you're going to have to um, consider how to introduce pets of the same species together, so interest species introduction. So, if you already have dogs at home, you're going to want to think about how you're going to introduce the dogs to each other. If you have cats, birds, rodents, any other type of animal, you're going to have to consider that as well. I have dogs, cats, and a snake as well in my house. So um, everybody gets along for the Miz part really well. But when I brought this puppy home last week, um, who is boarding with me um, for the next few weeks, I had to be very careful in how I introduced her to the other animals. So she was fine with the dogs, and I knew that. Um, with my dogs at least, she's met them before, but she's never met the cats before. So I needed to make sure that she wasn't going to just chase the cats. I needed to make sure the cats had a safe place to escape to so that they could meet her on their own terms because cats are like that and that's okay. Um, safe and um, stress-free stress -free interactions are the best way to go about it, especially with cats. Uh, she is not allowed anywhere near my snake because um, she, ha she has a little bit of prey drive and my snake is a very active ball python. And although he is out of his enclosure often with me, um, never unsupervised, um, I worry that she will hurt him and I don't want that to happen. So you gotta think about these, how you're going to do that. In terms of dog on dog, um, dog to dog introductions for the first time, I prefer it to happen outside in a neutral area especially if you have an older dog that's a little sketch around other dogs or you don't know how they're going to or, um, interact with puppies or new dogs. Um, 
I um, when I introduced Sansa to Flash, I introduced them in the backyard, and it went well. I actually introduced them at my friend's house down the street, um, because that was a neutral area. It was a fenced-in yard, and they had plenty of room to get away from each other, and it went really, really well. And then I reintroduced them in my own backyard before I brought Flash into the house. Now, my girl, I know she's good with puppies. However, this was a whole different situation, bringing a puppy home to stay versus having her interact with a puppy for only a couple hours. You know what I'm saying? It's a very different thing. And she loved him until she realized he was here to stay. And then she was like, dear God, make him go away because she wasn't getting all the attention all to herself anymore. Um, and this is especially important if you're bringing home an adult rescue who you're unsure of. Within those situations, I tend to bring them home and I wait for introductions. I don't introduce them right away. I let them get used to their new home. I get them used to their dog's smells and sounds. So I do a scent transfer. So I'll take, for example, the bed of my existing dog and I will introduce that smell to the new dog so they're familiar with it once they come into my home. Um, and vice versa, if I have something of the new dogs and I will give it to my own dog so that they can smell it. And that's called scent transfer. And, and they're able to like kind of sort of introduce. Once I'm sure that the new dog is um, decompressing and adjusting well, then I can start introductions through barriers, um, X pens, baby gates, crates, that kind of thing. They'll go on leashed walks together down the neighborhood. I'll have a friend help me or a colleague help me hold my dog while I hold and train the new dog or the new puppy. And that's exactly how I plan on doing it when I bring home my new puppy, hopefully next year, because Flash is actually a little sketchy around puppies. He doesn't like them too much because they get in his face and he doesn't like it when puppies get into his face. So when I bring him a new puppy, it's going to be very, very slow um, of an introduction. How long does it take for new dogs to settle in? Um, anywhere between three and six weeks is what I tell people to expect. So some dogs can adjust really quickly. Some dogs, it takes them like a few days. And then other dogs, it can take honestly up to a few months. And all of this is normal. Dogs live in the moment. Um, they don't generalize very well. And they don't know that things are going to be okay down the line. Like we can't talk to them. We can't tell them these things. And so they can only go with how they're feeling in the moment and what they've known in the past. So for example, if you have a dog who's already anxious, already predisposed to some problem behaviors um, and has never really had all that much structure in the past, and you bring them into a new home, they're going to be like, what the heck is going on? I don't know these dogs. I don't know these people. I don't know these smells. I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to get fed? Where am I sleeping? Do, am I safe? And it's going to take them a few weeks, up to a few months for them to realize that, yes, they are indeed going to be safe. And for puppies, really, it's no different. We're taking them away from the only home they've ever known if they came from a breeder, for example. And um, oftentimes, that's the first time they're away from their siblings. And, you know, that can be scary. So expect a rough few nights. And that's totally normal. Don't sweat it. Um, is definitely something that you're going to have to um, grin and bear it, um, oops. much like um, when you bring home a new baby, um, grin and bear it for a few, for a couple of weeks, and it will be, it will all work out. How long does it take to house train puppies? Well, that's another one where it depends. If you ask a dog trainer, any dog trainer with their salt, the answer to almost any question is it depends, uh, because there's 700 million different factors to consider. Um, some puppies are a lot easier to potty train than others. Sansa, my older girl, it took her nearly a year to potty train. I wanted to go bash my head into a wall. She was my very first dog. I didn't even like dogs. I didn't even like her to start with. So then I had this dog that was like a horror to house train. It was awful. And then we had Flash, who was a love to house train. I think in the first year of his life, he had all of, I don't know, maybe four accidents. That's it. It was lovely. And he was intact until he was four years old. So like we didn't have any in the house marking issues. Really, we didn't have many issues at all. However, my job as a dog walker and a dog trainer really helped because he came to work with me quite a bit. And so I was able to help dog uh, potty train him as much as I could. All right. 
Next up is the uh, the word of the century, I guess. It is it is one of the biggest buzzwords in dog training and dog ownership. Socialization. <laughs> what is it and how do we do it? Um, the important things to think about when it comes to socialization are it is quality over quantity. I would rather a dog have, or a puppy specifically, I would rather a puppy have one really good experience a month rather than 30 mediocre experiences a month. Does that make sense? So I'd rather them have one really good interaction with another dog a month than one eh, one every day. Um, and that matters. Puppies don't really need to, and dogs in general, they don't need to meet every single dog to make sure they're going to be good with dogs. They don't need to meet every single person in order for them to be good with people. They don't need to go to every single new place. They don't need to touch every new, single new thing. They don't need to. They, what they actually need is a few really good, impactful, excellent 10 out of 10 interactions with people or dogs or places or things. And then they can generalize from there. Because if they've had like 10 excellent experiences and then they had one really bad one that impacted them so badly because like say they were attacked, that's the one that's going to stick with them, not the 10 good ones. That's just the way it works. Um, and it also depends on the dog's uh, temperament. If you have a dog with a super stable, sociable temperament, then you're probably going to get away with um, a lot more than you would if you had an anxious dog. Um, so quality over quantity, always, always, always. And you want it to be dog led which means the dog dictates how this interaction is gonna go. So Miss Tanaya here um, is very, very anxious around the cat. She's super over aroused by them and it just means overexcited. Don't let your brains go anywhere. Um, it just means she's super excited by the cats and she really wants to chase and play with them because they are small prey type animals they, that move super fast or they slink. Like they don't just move normally. That's just how my cats are. And so she finds that super interesting and super fun. And so she is fixated on that. Now, my two cats, unfortunately, don't care. And so they don't correct her. They don't do anything about it. And then they don't hide from her. They just exist in the world and expect her to live on their terms. And she's not going to. And because of this, that's a really bad experience for her. She's learning over and over that she can get away with treating cats badly, with chasing cats. So she currently is being managed through an X-Pen. She, she lives in an X-Pen off area of the living room when I am there to supervise her. And the cats have an area where that they can go. They, they're trained, and because I'm a little bit of a nerd and I train my cats, um, they're trained that when an X-Pen is up, you don't go in it. And, um, she respects the boundary and they respect the boundary. And so she, she can watch them from afar and interact with them. And then when she ignores them and comes to engage with me, she gets a party. She gets a whole bunch of food rewards, playtime with me. She does not, however, get to greet the cat. Hopefully over the next few days, she will settle in a little bit more and ignore the cat. Fingers crossed. Another big thing to think about, especially with young dogs, is fear periods. Dogs go through several fear periods during their childhood, childhood, puppyhood, and adolescence. Um, what they are are just periods where they seem like they're magically afraid of everything or something in particular. They go through multiples of them. Um, the last one tends to be, um, they don't tend to have any after they're two years old. Um, they, they have a really big one right around eight to 10 weeks old. And that's usually when we bring puppies home, isn't it? So I tend to like to, I think my next dog, I will ask the breeder to keep the dog until the dog is 12 weeks old in the hopes of, um, you know, mitigating that a little bit because um, the breeder I've chosen is a ways away and I will have to drive, drive quite a distance to bring this puppy home. Um, and I would like nothing bad to happen during that period. So I might have her keep him a little bit or her it, I don't know, keep the puppy a little bit longer. Um, because of it, they get another fear period somewhere around like four-ish months old. And usually there's one around 18 months old. That's a year and a half old. Um, 
usually ish. So we want to be wary of that. How do we how do we determine what a fear period? If all of a sudden they wake up one day and they are magically afraid of something that they were not afraid of the day before, chances are it's a fear period. What you're gonna do is you're going to pretend it's not happening. So for example, if you bring your puppy home and everything's going great, he's the most social dog in the whole wide world, loved everyone, suddenly afraid of like weird men or women with long hair or you know whatever. If they're suddenly afraid of people, or even just one certain person, you're not going to make the puppy go say hi to that person. You're going to say, okay, that's fine. And then you're going to avoid either that individual person or that type of person, depending on the pattern you see, for like a week or two. If after the week or two, you reintroduce the puppy to the thing it's afraid of, and then they're fine, then you're golden. You don't have to do anything else beautiful. If they still, after a week or two, have issues, then you have something you need to work through because that's not how long fear periods last. They only last about a week. Um, the worst thing you can do in the middle of a fear period is make the puppy say hi. And what I mean by make the puppy say hi is, is might be a little different than how you interpret that. So let me explain a little bit. By make the puppy say hi, I mean bribing the puppy to go see the thing, um, luring the puppy with food, nagging the puppy, coaxing the puppy, all of that stuff is making the puppy. So just ignore the thing. If the puppy is fearful of a thing in its puppyhood and it's a brain spanking new thing, for example, it's fine, the dog doesn't have to go say hi. Try again next week. I know a puppy that was afraid of a stump. A week later, the stump was no big deal. Not a big deal. All right, so basic training the positive way. Look at this lovely, lovely, lovely group sit stay here. And that's me and my dog. So I try to, um, should I say, I do ascribe to something called Lima training or Lima, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It just stands for least intrusive and minimally aversive. It means I go for the least intrusive um, method for training and the most minimally aversive, aversive meaning um, unpleasant um, method possible. So. Oftentimes that starts with the same way the humane hierarchy starts with. And that's making sure all the dog's basic needs are met. I'm currently working with a um, dog reactive dog who um, currently our training plan is focusing on me meeting the dog's needs emotionally and physically. So the dog is out for a lot of decompression walks in the woods. It's a scent hound. It needs a lot of scenting opportunity, a lot of opportunity to move its body. And this is the first step. I just introduced the dog to a, um, a, a, a friend to walk with, and I use the term loosely because neither of one of them wants to interact with the other, but they are not doing anything aversive to each other. So they're not attacking each other. They're not um, growling at each other. They're not guarding from each other. They're just pretending the other dog doesn't exist. And that's okay, because that's exactly what I want them to do. I want them to learn, like specifically the client. I mean, the other dog is my dog. Um, I want the client dog to learn that it's okay to exist in another dog's space. The dog, like, you don't have to yell about it. You don't have to lunge about it. Like, you don't have to make a big fuss about it. It's okay. And that's what this dog is learning right now while having his needs met. Um, so that's currently what I'm doing. Um, we will revisit um, his training plan in a few weeks and see how he's progressing. Um, so that's basically what, what that means. So we start with the very, very most basic things. For me, that is making sure all their needs are met. Um, is the dog fed? Is the dog being fed a nutritionally balanced meal? Is the dog um, healthy? Is the dog happy? Is the dog enriched? Is the dog resting? Are all the dog's needs met? Um, and then, like I keep saying, I'm a certified control and leash instructor. So what is control of leash? There's a program developed to give the dog confidence by teaching them that there is, in fact, a system and that they can work the system to get the rewards that they want. And that reward could either be a food reward, a toy reward, or even distance from a trigger. Um, I like to develop, like I said, a communication system. And so I'm my own dog is a reactive dog. That's Flash the White Boxer. He's a super reactive dog. And he had, he developed, we developed a system where 
he can tell me that he's uncomfortable without having to bark and lunge at other dogs. And I respect when he tells me, and I listen to him the first time, because if I listen to him the first time, then he won't need to escalate to those behaviors that he used to resort to in the past. Um, and that's what Control Unleashed is all about. Does positive, oh, does positive training work for every dog? Absolutely. Why? Because the definition of positive training, uh, positive reinforcement training. Um, positive reinforcement means you add, that's the positive, you're adding a stimulus that increases the likelihood of a behavior occurring. So you're reinforcing a behavior. That means, you know, you're, you're increasing the likelihood of a behavior to uh, occur again by adding a stimulus. Usually this is a food or toy reward. Um, and we often use food just because food is a primary reinforcement. Dogs need it to survive. They cannot survive without food. And that is why it usually works. You are not bribing your dog. That is a whole different story. Nor, nor are you coercing your dog with food. And we can get into the nuance there. But positive reinforcement works for every single dog. If it's not working, there is likely things going on other than just the, the cut and dry basic, the dog does a thing and you give him a cookie. You know what I'm saying? There are other more complicated things going along. But yes, technically positive training does work for every single dog. You do wanna train the dog in front of you. Um, and all that means honestly is meeting the dog where it's at and meeting its needs and going from there. So like I said, this, this um, scent town that I'm working with, I'm, I'm training the dog in front of me. I'm using positive reinforcement with him. I, I have a puppy trying to eat my hand here and it's not working for me. Um, so I'm trying to meet him where he's at. And right now where he's at is he needs to move his body. He needs to sniff. He needs to track. And that is where he is. And that is how I'm training him. I also have another dog reactive, leash reactive um, client currently. And their um, training plan looks vastly different. This dog does not need remedial socialization the way this dog, uh, the way my scent pound does. This dog doesn't need decompression walks. This dog has his needs, needs met. So we're going for a different route. Reward markers. What are they and do they matter? So the answer is yes, they do matter. What are they? Have you guys heard of a clicker? It's a box or a thing with a button and you click it, it makes a clicky sound and positive reinforcement trainers use it all the time. That is a marker. And the marker tells, excuse me, that's my water, you can't have it. Um, the marker tells the dog that food is coming. We like to describe it in, in like our puppy classes that the, the clicker tells the dog that they did the right thing. But in reality, what it does is it tells the dog that food is coming. So the dog's like, oh my God, that sound happened. That means food is coming. How did I make that sound happen? And then they try things again. And then they'll do the thing that, that works. So for example, sitting, putting their butt on the ground, we lure them up, their butt hits the ground, you click, and then you give them the, the cookie. They're like, oh my gosh, that was so great. Click my, I got a cookie. And then eventually they're gonna be like, okay, so when I make this motion, when I put my butt on the ground, that makes the click happen. And that's how you get a dog to learn. So you didn't actually mark the behavior. You just marked that food is coming. And then they want to make that, that mark happen, that click happen. So they're going to try behaviors and behaviors that get them the click more often. Those are the behaviors they're going to default to. So that's how we use clickers. I use verbal markers as well because I don't always carry a clicker with me. I mean, I should, but I don't always carry a clicker with me. So, but I always have my voice with me. Um, so I use a lot of verbal markers. I use tongue clicks. I use the word yes. I use the word get it if I'm going to toss a cookie. I use the word scatter if I'm going to toss a handful of cookies on the ground for them to sniff out and eat. That's really good for getting their noses going. I, I need to look, I need to see. Um, it's really good for getting their noses going and getting their sniff on, and that helps lower excitement and stress and arousal. So that's all reward markers are. They're wonderful. They matter because they add clarity. If your dog knows that it got a cookie for a reason, the dog is going to be more apt to work. So for example, if you're just feeding your dog without telling him that he did something right or that you're giving him a cookie, he thinks he's just getting cookies just because he doesn't associate the cookies with the behavior. Okay, behavior modification, the positive way. So this is Tawny. Um, this is a half sister to this puppy and my cat monster. Um, I'm dremeling her nails. 
Um, she it has been notoriously bad about nails when she was at her um, owner's house. So when she came to stay with me a few weeks, uh, a few months ago, last year at this point, holy moly, it was a whole year ago at this point. When she came to stay with me last year, one of the things that we worked on was her behavior for getting her nails done. So when it comes to behavior modification, like I said, the very, very first step is I check for physical wellness that visit. And I mean an overall wellness check. I want to know if there are any slip discs. I want to know what the blood work says. I want x-rays. I want everything done. And usually those are the things where I go for like real aggression cases, you know, like bite cases, resource guarding, those kind of things, sudden behavior changes, sudden aggression changes. That's where I go. For it. Um, and then I go about behavioral wellness. All that means is I make sure that their nutrition needs, needs are being met, their exercise needs are being met, their enrichment and communication needs are also super important. And these are not steps that you take one and then the other and then the other. These are all steps that you work on all at the same time. Um, these are all equal priorities. And then we go about um, counter conditioning and desensitization, that's CCDS. And what that is, is it is technically classical conditioning, which means think um, Pavlov's dog, a bell rings and then food appears. You click and then food appears. You see what I'm saying? So that's called classical conditioning. Um, it is just making the association um, of good things when other good things are there. So in that case, it was the bell told um, Pavlov's dog that food was coming. And so he, he heard a bell and he started drooling in anticipation of food. He was classically conditioned to the bell. Um, I classically condition like dog reactive dogs to see a dog and know that that means they're getting a whole bunch of cookies or if they're toy motivated, then they're gonna get a really good session of tug. But they have to be calm about it. But that's the nuance we'll get into later. Um, so you're changing the dog's emotional response to triggers, dogs, people, procedures, or just the environment. In this case, in the picture I'm showing, I think it's a, no, it's a video. Um, in this video, it's just um, um, the procedure of nail prints is what I'm changing um, and desensitizing her feelings to. How long does it take? Well, it takes as long as it takes. There are no quick fixes. It really depends. It really depends on the dog. Are the dog's needs being met? Is the dog in any kind of pain? How long has the dog been displaying this type of behavior? What kind of training have you done in the past? How much unlearning does the dog have to do? All of this stuff matters. There is no such thing as a quick fix. And if someone's offering you a quick fix, please run. Please run as fast as you can. There are no such thing as quick fixes. No matter the method, whether it is positive reinforcement training, or balance training, if someone is offering you a quick fix, please run. So the next question, and then I'll play the clip from this video, is management or training? What's the difference and which should you use? Well, the correct answer is both. You should always use both, management and training. What is the difference? So management is making sure that a behavior doesn't take place, but you're not actively training it. So for example, with Tanaya right now, the puppy, um, she um, has, you know, a tendency to chase my cat. So instead of actively training her, because she's not in a place mentally or emotionally currently to be able to learn not to chase the cat. So I'm currently managing her. How I manage her is having her behind an X pen. I crate and rotate the cats, all my cats. If you live in my house, you are crate trained. So therefore the cats are also crate trained. And so sometimes I give the cats a break and I put Tanaya in a crate. Then sometimes I give Tanaya a break and I put the cats in a crate. And that way no one has to see each other. And then that stress and arousal isn't constantly there. She'll look for them, she'll look for them, and then she'll see that they're not there anymore. And then she can help herself relax and vice versa. Because even when she's in her own crate, she's still able to relax better than she could before. Um, while um, even if she was just in an x -Men with more room to move around. She is a dog that needs stillness in order to think. She can't think while she's moving around. Some dogs need movement to be able to express their, um, and uh, to, to, sorry, not express, but to take in their surroundings and process their environment and their triggers. Other dogs need stillness. She needs stillness. Um, so here's a video of Tawny. Like I said, this is this puppy's half sister. She's about three years old. So let's watch how I desensitize her to the Dremel. Um, she, again, has very big feelings about the Dremel. She is not happy about it. There is a bowl of food between us. And then there is a cat who thinks that he is getting his nails Dremel too. 
So I give her some food. I wait until she's done eating before I try to pick up her paw again. I pick up her paw and I go tap, tap, tap. Just two taps. And then she gets a whole bunch of kibble for it. And see how she relaxed onto one hip. She's looking away. She's not quite happy. There's some lip lipping. Her ears are back. I want to um, go back again so you can see that. So she's not happy at all. Her, she turns her face away. She's lip licking right there. And then her ears are back. All of that is saying, I don't like this. Those are called calming signals. Um, but my criteria for this session was do not pull your feet away. If she pulls her feet away, then we would stop for a minute. She would still get her cookies because I want this to be a happy experience for her. But she did not want to put, pull her paw away. That's me moving her foot right there just to help um, towards the end there. That was just me, like uh, the Dremel touching it. So me moving it, like there was no pulling away. So this was a very, very successful um, um, session. And now let's get nerdy about behavior modification. I do something called consent-based training as well. Um, it's, it's cooperative training, depending on who's, who's teaching it, who's training it. I like to introduce consent. I like to call it consent-based training. Um, so let's introduce consent. What is consent in dog training? And yes, dogs can consent. So can cats, so can babies. Everybody has the ability to consent. Even if they don't have the cognitive ability to understand what consent is, like we do. Like you and I both know, um, no means no. And that means you don't have consent to do whatever it is that, that's happening in the moment. When it comes to dogs, they don't understand it that way. They understand it in terms of I like this, I don't like this, or I like the result of this, or I don't like the result of this. Does that make sense? So all we do is set things up. We, we set up the environment and we set up the training so that they have the ability to walk away. Um, it's called antecedent arrangement. Antecedent is the thing that pre, pre curses. <laughs> it's the thing that precedes, <laughs> that's the word, the behavior that we, we either want or don't want to see. So for example, with my dog reactive dog, the antecedent is the appearance of another dog. The behavior that then occurs is bark, bark, bark. The consequence of that behavior is either the dog goes away, the dog comes closer, he gets food, he gets rewarded somehow, or he doesn't. So what I did in order to manage his, um, what do you call it, reactivity was as soon as he saw a dog, I would click immediately. And then he would go, oh, that means food. And then he turns to me and he gets fed and then he gets distance. So he still gets what he wants, distance from the dog, but he got it without all that bluster. So I just set it up, antecedent arrangement. I just set it up so that he would be successful. So introducing consent. Um, cooperative counter conditioning is putting the dog in charge of their counter conditioning protocols. So like we talked about before, what counter conditioning and desensitization is, we're putting the dog in control. So the dog starts the procedure and has the ability to stop the procedure or continue the procedure. It establishes trust because the animal is in control. And let me tell you something, if you don't know this, control is a primary reinforcer, just like food. And that is the same for people as well as dogs. Uh, and especially for cats. Huh? So it establishes trust. The animal says start, stop, or continue. The animal can leave at any point. So like I said, does the dog really understand? In theory, yes. The dog understands that if they do this, then they get this. And if they don't do this, then they don't get this. But in practice, if they do the thing, you know, like it, as long as they do it and they're comfortable and they're successful, does it really matter? Like going back to the previous video, my criteria was don't pull your hand, your paw away. And she did in that session, pull her paw away a few times and she got her cookies anyway, but not Dremel. I waited, I asked, I, I put her paw in my hand again. If she pulled it away, I, we would have stopped. But she never pulled it away after a few times. Like I think it was three or four times in a half hour session. Like that's not a lot. And it was only in the beginning. So in theory, yes, they understand if the dog presses the button, the cat gets fed, and then she gets fed. You're going to see a video here very shortly. Um, in practice, as long as the dog is comfortable and the procedure is successful, it really doesn't matter, like I said. So Sansa, my brindle bitch over here, she is a, um, uh, a very dangerous resource guarder, which means she will bite 
if she feels that her resource is being taken away from her. That's all I mean by a dangerous resource card. She, she has the ability and the propensity to bite. Has she bitten? Yes. <laughs> has she bitten a person? No. Thank God. But she has bitten another animal. Um, and she has very, very big feelings about food. So what you're going to see is a procedure called voluntary sharing. And really all it is, is she does a start button and it's a literal start button. A start button is the thing that the dog does to begin a procedure. And here it's a literal start button. If you see the little orange button right there, um, it talks, it says, yes, please. If she hits it, I give the cat a cookie and then I give her a cookie. So really what she's, what she's learning is that if she hits the button, the cat gets a cookie. She does the behavior, the cat gets a cookie. But the cat gets a cookie, she gets a cookie. That's what we want to happen. There are very clear rules. This, this started out, like this is a pretty advanced session with her. This started out with her behind an X10 with a remote feeder, like a food robot, like a man, manners minder, where um, she hit the button, I fed the cat by hand, and then I pressed the button and she got a cookie. Um, and now they're able to do it next to each other, but on platforms. Both of them have to be on platforms. So let's see how this goes. She hit it, he gets a cookie. You see how very intently she's staring. He hits it, he gets a cookie, and then she gets it. Notice how one foot came off the platform. She finished eating. She looks at him, notice how she stiffens. She's staring at him. I want to go back here. So notice quickly how quickly she stiffens. She's looking at him. She looks at me. She looks at him. She's very uncomfortable. He moves towards the bowl. I had to cover it. She hard stares him. I really thought I was going to have to do some really quick management there. But then she hit the button. She became okay with it again. And she kept going. She was only okay with it because he put his paw back onto the platform. I really truly thought we had gone too far and that I was going to have to do some real quick intervention and get my cat out of there um, for his safety. But I didn't have to. She felt safe enough. She said, we've done this enough times. The cat is on his platform. He's not going for my food. It's all good. I can hit the button again. And that was the piece I really wanted to show. So <sighs> why do we do this when we can solve the problem quicker? Well, again, like I said, there is a lot of fallout to quick fixes. So could I have solved her resource burning um, with more aversive and more forceful methods? Eh, eh, I tried, it didn't really work. All it did was um, suppress all her warning signs and she went straight to bite. That's really all it did. Could I have done it positively but faster? Yeah, but she has had such a history of me I, either taking away her resource or, or um, before I knew any better um, being mean to her um, that I really needed to work hard to gain her trust. And that's, that's on the fallout of quick fixes. There's, there's so much fallout, so much fallout. Resource guarding is one of, the, one of the most dangerous things to work on and one of the easiest things to do wrong. Um, so are these procedures really that successful? Yeah, like I said, she's she's been so, so food aggressive. She's super food aggressive. She's attacked multiple dogs over food. Um, she had to be fed behind two barriers. She was less than two feet away from this cat right now without barriers. And she she has the ability to bite people. She just hasn't because I haven't allowed it to happen. But she could. All right. Now that we got all that fun stuff out of the way, let's talk about dog walkers. Did you know I'm also a dog walker? I'm also a dog walker. I serve as the Waltham in Belmont area. Um, I work for a company called Active Cause, shameless plug. Hire us, we're wonderful, because then you'll get me. Um, what to look for in a dog walker? Hmm. Um, you definitely want a dog walker that will schedule meet and greets. Um, usually meet and greets are covered. If you need a second one, then you'll likely be charged. But these are um, opportunities for you to interview your dog walker who will be providing you a service. You want to see how they're going to interact with your dogs and interact with you. But also, if this is a really good company and a really good dog walker, they're also interviewing you as a client. So keep that in mind. The meet and greets are for both of you, not just you. Um, <clears throat> you want to see that they take the time to meet and greet and observe your dog. Watch how they handle your dog. What are they doing? Are they getting easily frustrated? Are they getting mad at your dog? Are they being forceful for your dog with your dog for no good reason? Um, 
do they know how to read your dog's body language accurately? Do they know how to be, um, how to, how to pacify a dog that might be a little wary of strangers? Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. One of my biggest things that I'm seeing right now with all my clients last year, it was the, excuse me, separation anxiety. This year it is, um, dogs are having problems with people entering their home. So that's, that's what I'm seeing mostly right now. Um, so you wanna see how the, your, your potential dog walker will handle it. They are interviewing you as a potential client as much as you're interviewing them as a potential service provider, don't forget that. Uh, you wanna make sure that they're bonded, insured, and that they're pet first aid and CPR certified, of which I am, all of this. Um, that's really important. Um, and you can certainly ask those questions and, a lot of times dog walkers are a little wary of how people know these answers. You can just say you listen to an interview or a webinar and someone talks about it and said these are the one of the things that you want to look for. That's totally fine. All right, transitioning back into real life because that's something we're all doing right about now. I never stopped real life. Here you have my lovely puppy at my office at my first training, uh, training center job. Um, five-ish years ago at this point, he was such a cutie pie. We're going back to the enrichment pictures, the enrichment toy pictures, and then a puppy happy in a crate. You see he has a bed, you see he has a whole bunch of toys, you see he does not have a lot of space. The reason being is that I am kind of using the x pen here as a crate. He gets enough room to stand up, turn around comfortably, and lay down. I did not want to give him the entire office of space because I could have, the way the desk is set up, I could have opened up that x pen all the way and then he would have had the entire space behind the desk to um to roam around in but because I had to pay attention to the computer and my job and I could not pay total attention to him I did not want him running loose um because then he would have accidents that I would have to clean up and that would take away from my job and then he would become a nuisance and then I would not be allowed to bring him back to work but I needed to be able to bring him to work to help body train him and help socialize him and just because because it is the way my life worked at the time. Um, so he had a much smaller area. He had enough area where he was very likely not going to have an accident. And he's totally zonked out and happy and sleeping. So if you got a puppy anytime during the pandemic, the time to start is now. In fact, the time to start was right away, depending on how long you've had this puppy. You don't wanna wait until you go back to real life, until you go back to the office, the kids go back to school to get the puppy used to you guys being away. You should have been doing that all along because puppies could have developed, like so separation anxiety is a thing. And it's very easy for dogs to develop it. They get used to their habits. Like remember how I said in the beginning, what like, bringing a puppy home from a breeder, for example, for the first few nights is gonna be rough because this is the very first time they've ever been away from their siblings and their mom and the only life they've ever known for eight whole weeks. Um, well, now they're doing the same thing. You're, you're leaving them alone in a crate at home for hours on end, and they've never been alone before. Like, of course they're gonna struggle. And separation anxiety is one of the things I don't touch because it is one of the hardest things for me to deal with. Mainly because it takes a lot of time, a lot of patience and a lot of work, and a lot of people are not into doing that. So I'm not into doing it for them. Um, I refer separation anxiety out. Um, you wanna crate or confine them for short periods every single day, even if you're working from home, you wanna do this while they are um, in a different room from where you're working, for example. You want them to be used to being alone. Um, even better if you can work on a different level of the house than where your dog is being confined. You wanna leave them alone um, while you leave the house for a few hours. Um, like go to the grocery store, just go out, go to the movies, go somewhere, go somewhere. Go for a drive, go for a walk, leave your dog home in a crate. If you have the ability to, it is 2021, get a camera, put the camera on the dog. You can monitor the dog. Um, best thing I ever did was buy 700 million cameras to watch my dogs. Um, you know, who cares about home security when, when, when you can use these cameras just to watch your dog? I finally got them for the outside, but you know, that's a whole different side rant. Um, um, if there is separation anxiety, you want to reduce this to minutes. So you don't want to leave them alone for too, too long. Um, maybe even seconds, really depends on how bad it is. Again, if you are dealing with separation anxiety, please hire a professional, um, please hire a professional. You're gonna wanna give your dog something to do. You're gonna wanna give them food puzzles, safe chewies, um, safe shreddable items, for example, like I give my dogs the, the cardboard boxes or my junk mail and all that is safe. If they ingest a little bit of cardboard or a little bit of paper, it's not going to hurt them, it's 
for a pipe. I don't give them rope toys where they can ingest them, um, the ropes and have that turn into an obstruction. I don't give them um, stuffy toys. Like my, my girl who likes to shred toys, she does not get stuffy toys when she's by herself because she could chew them and eat them. And that could be a very, very expensive surgery in a few days. So I, I don't do that. I give them things that they can't um, hurt themselves on. So if you're gonna give them a raw marrow bone, for example, um, you want to make sure that the size is appropriate so it doesn't get stuck on their jaw. You have no idea how many times I've walked into puppies' houses, dogs' houses, and found dogs with bones stuck on their bottom jaw because it was an inappropriate size for them. Um, so don't give them anything that they could hurt themselves on while they're by themselves. Anything that is pictured here in these pictures, um, the top right and then the bottom, those are totally safe things to give your dogs and leave them alone. You don't want to make a big deal of coming or going. Put the dog in the crate and go. When you come home, take the dog out of the crate, go outside. Not a big deal. Do not make a big deal of greeting. Do not make a big deal of leaving. That's, that's just stuff that makes you feel better. And all it does is reinforce the rituals of coming and going. And it can help increase separation anxiety. So don't do those. Just make it a normal everyday. Thing. All right. So those are the most basics of dog sports. Um, if you're interested in uh, dog sports, of uh, dog training, if you're interested in sports, I have a few things that you can watch here. Um, the first thing that, um, sorry, my brain super stopped. I just had to check the time to see what we're on and then my brain stopped working while I did math. All right, so there are so many options. You can do obedience, rally, freestyle, which is a type of obedience. Agility, tri ball. Tri ball is so much fun. They are basically hurting a whole bunch of balls and it's so much fun. Um, you can do herding if you have a herding dog. Scent sports like nose worker, tracking, um, dock diving, so much fun. And then there's lure coursing. There's so many things that you can do with your dogs. So many things. Um, so, how you're going to get started? A quick Google search of dog training facilities in the area. Um, Danvers. Danvers, Danvers, Danvers. There should be every dog learning center. She, um, the owner of that facility is a phenomenal trainer. She's a wonderful, wonderful colleague. Um, then there's uh, Raynham, I think is up there. I'm not so familiar with the north part of the state. I'm sorry. Um, I think Raynham, Fit and Trim, I know is up there. No, Rowley, Rowley, that's the one, Rowley. Raynham's the other way. Um, Fit and Trim is another facility. They do agility and other things there as well. So you can like Google these things and you can Google agility classes near me, things like that. You wanna go and you wanna check out the facility. You wanna see, ask if you can sit in on a class. Any trainer with their salt will say, okay, that's no problem. Allow you to sit in and observe. Um, and yeah, so what kinds of dogs are best for sports? Frankly, any dog can be good at any sport. It really depends on the dog's physical capabilities and mental capabilities. So Flash, he is trained in all sorts of different sports. He only actively competes in scent sports, obedience, and lure coursing currently because agility gets him a little too over aroused and too overexcited, and he does not have a sense of self-preservation. So that can be very dangerous while he's going over jumps. He's on A-frames. He's on dog walks, which are five feet above the ground. Um, he has fallen off the, uh, so many dog walks. He has jumped fences and um, like, the ring fencing and stuff. He's, he's jumped fences and gone for dogs and crates. Uh, he does not do that anymore. However, he still has the, the tendency to do it. So we don't compete often. We do introductory levels. We play in other um, venues. We don't just play in AKC and things like that. So he does really well in obedience. He actually flourishes in obedience and he flourishes in set sports. He's such a phenomenal and fun dog. And he's also my rehabber. He, he comes now he used to be so reactive and now he helps other dogs learn how not to be reactive. It's great. Um, what are the benefits of sport training? Remember the whole communication and enrichment thing that we were talking about? Exercise as well. Like it can help meet so many needs for your dogs. And it's something so fun and you can help build your relationship with your dogs. I never thought I would ever compete in any of these sports with Sansa. I started them for something to do to help bond with and learn to like this dog that I was stuck with. And um Turned out my dog was really smart and I didn't think she was at the time. Um, turns out she's really smart and then turns out she's really good at sports and turns out I'm a really good dog. Um, so the rest is history. So which one should you do? Hey, try them all out, figure it out. Figure it out. Stick with one you both seem to like. 
That's why I stuck with obedience and nose work with flash. So here's a quick, I don't know, minute, 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 minute. Let's find out. One and a half minute video of flash doing lore coursing at the beginning of this year. So let's just do this quick one. If this one's an instinct based sport, they either have it or not. He's chasing fake bunnies. This is based off of the sport of lore coursing for sight hounds. He is a non sight hound, so he cannot actually compete in lore coursing. What he competes in is something called coursing ability tests, which is kind of the same thing, but for non sight hounds. It's a pass or fail type of set, uh, test. They don't have placement. So let's watch this boxer do his thing. 600 yards. Watch him go. And they're ready. Okay, Hitler. I'm getting ready. I'm removing his leash. I'm prepping him. That's the lure operator. Operator ready. The hunt master is doing. Watch how fast that dog runs. And all he's doing is chasing those plastic bags around. Look how fast he's going. He can run up to 26 miles per hour, this dog. Um, and that's not even the fastest boxer speed. Um, the fastest one I know of is about 28 miles per hour. He's smart. He was cutting um, the corner. He lost the lure. And she was hoping, the videographer was hoping he would go to it. He's actually hanging out around the generator because he knows the generator makes it sound. So I'm just kind of helping encourage him to go back. I'm just encouraging him. And he's like, oh, there they are. Great. Let's go again. He, he is obsessed with this game, like too obsessed with this game. He loves it so much. He's like, oh, where'd it go? I didn't expect the turn. And really, this is all it is. It's so much fun. It's great. Um, I don't do this too often with him. And you really have to make sure your dog is physically fit to be able to play the sport. Because this sport is really hard on your dogs. And they're ready. And here we have a clip of Flash doing an exterior nose work search. This is his uh, nose work level one titling uh title um this was his very first search of the day it's pouring rain and you will see how quickly he finds the hive there we are starting in the back the judge and the timer are off screen over here he's watching them he's making sure they're not going to eat him because he has very big feelings and then i started him he's like i'm watching okay i'm fine and all i'm doing is helping him back into the search area he feels the need to watch them and then i just encourage him to go search He's like, is anybody going to eat me? No, all right. And there you found he caught the hide. I I saw he found it. I called alert. That was the judge said yes. And then I'm feeding him. And that was really just the whole search. And that was the first search of the day. It was great. Ah, this is his next search. I think this was his last search of the day. He found it very quickly. He has a problem with people watching him, so I had to have him watch these people very quickly. He's like, oh no, what am I doing? I'm encouraging him to watch, to search the boxes. And he's searching each one for the target odor. He found it there, but he moved off, so I didn't call it. This is pre-COVID, hence the nomads. And then he was like, no, I'm pretty sure it's that yeah. one. So I just called alert and then I got a yes and I fed him. I didn't even need to search the rest of the boxes because I knew there was only one high. We are trialing this weekend at the nose work level three um, level, the three level. And um, in those search areas, there could be zero to three highs. So there could be no hides, one, two or three highs. We don't get to know the answer. The dog has to tell us. So I have to, it's more of a teamwork than it is at, this, at the level one. Um, because here it's really dog led. The dog has to find the one hide in the area. At this level, we have to work together as a team. Did you search this area? Did you search this area? What is your body language telling me? What is our training telling me, et cetera, et cetera. It's so much fun. It's very passive. It's very confidence building for dogs. Like Flash truly, truly, truly learned how to be a confident dog through nose work. Um, it was one of the biggest things for our behavior modification plan with my own dog. Like, like, you can tell if he doesn't do nose work like three times a week, one week, one day a week we go to class and the other two I train by myself. If we don't do it at least three times a week. A lot of problem behaviors start popping back up. And here is Sansa playing some agility. This is what agility looks like. This is my old lady a few years ago. She loves this game. This is all tunnels. 
He has to navigate the course accurately. Tunnelers is a really hard game because look at all those tunnels. Look at all those off courses. It works. See how she wanted to go straight to that purple one and instead I had to find a way to get her to go to the green one while still keeping her confidence up because this dog doesn't like to be wrong. Big finish. Yay. So she doesn't like to be wrong and tunnels are really hard because there's so many tunnels there. Like there's so many opportunities for her to take the wrong place. And then here um, is just some practice for obedience. Um, I'm going to show you what go out and directed jumping look like. So I, I marked to the stanchion. I told him to go out. I asked him to sit. He can't do a full ring go out yet, at least at the time of this video being taken. So I did a half ring. I moved back and now I'm directing him over specific jumps. He's only just learning this exercise. And this is a utility utility level exercise. Utility is like the PhD of dogs. It's very, very, um, it takes an incredible amount of training. And then we go out again for part two of the exercise, which is just jumping over the other jump. Now he has been conditioned to jump over the bar jump, um, the one to the left, because we just did that. Muscle memory will tell him to go over that jump again. Um, he has to accurately take the high jump when I ask him to. He wants to lay down because that's what he was reinforced for recently. We've been doing a lot of drop on recalls. And he's like, oh, heck yeah, that jump. Look at how nice and fast he comes in. I'm waiting for eye contact before I ask him to get back into the heel position. Look at him go. It was great. Anyway, so that's that. That's where you can find me. I'll also add all that information into the chat for you guys. That's my social media and my email. Um, and if you have any questions, I can't wait to hear them all. So let's get over to um, here and uh, yeah. Well, look, questions, lots of questions. Hi everyone, I'm back. All right, let's see. So, um, Marjorie, the name of the facility in Danvers, I think it's in Danvers, is um, Every Dog, I'm going to write it here, Every Dog Learning Center. And I can do a quick Google search just to make sure that that's the one I'm thinking of or see where it is. So let me do that real quick for you just to make sure. Every Dog Learning Center. Um, yes, it's in Danvers. Every Dog Training Center, not Learning Center, I'm sorry about that. Every Dog Training Center is on um, Andover Street in Danvers. Wonderful, wonderful owner, wonderful facility, like 10 out of 10 would recommend. All right, so I have a couple questions here in the chat. I'll answer them to the best of my ability. And then if you have questions live, go for it, please do. Um, so I have a question here. It says, how to stop a dog from barking who tries to jump through the window if another dog goes by, actually jumps through the curtain, jumps on the table, etc. She's two years old. She growls if someone comes into the house and then licks them until I remove her. So your dog is, um, your dog is a little anxious. I'll, I'll tell you this right now. Um, the, the licking people um, and growling, like all of that is what I call or what is called information seeking behavior. The dog is seeking information. And the way dogs seek information from people is often either through really aggressive type behaviors, barky, lungy, growly, or through appeasement behaviors, which is licky, crawly. Those are the dogs that like kind of want to crawl in your skin. Think boxers. Y'all have met boxers. Y'all either like people either love or hate boxers. There is no in between. There is no eh, they're fine. There's no in between. Why? Because they're bouncy, bouncy, licky, annoying type dogs. Um, that's often information seeking. They want to know, are you going to eat me? Are you going to love me? Like, what are we doing? Um, also being a working breed, they are a lot of energy. But 
it sounds like your dog, the growling and then the licking until you remove her, that, that's all information seeking. She just needs to know about these people. So you can help her learn about these people through different protocols, including desensitization. Quick tips um, can include um, either leashing your dog when people come over or crating your dog when people come over, give them something to um, occupy themselves with, like a bone or a Kong or something um, to, to just enrich them and give their mind something to do so that they can calm themselves down. When it comes to the barking and jumping at the window, um, oh boy, oh boy, that's my favorite thing to deal with. Uh, if you couldn't tell that was sarcastic. Um, one of the things that I like to do is, honestly, I throw food at my dog. I throw food at dogs that are barking at windows. And the reason why is because then your dog will associate that whatever is coming through, the, um, passing the window, whatever they're seeing, brings food. It makes it rain food. And I mean, like, I have a bowl of kibble that lives on my tabletop, and I just toss a handful of food. And I tell my dog. So, like, I tell my dog, scatter, just like I would click. I would say scatter and they come running for the handful of food that I'm gonna throw on the carpet. That's what I do. Um, so your dog will run to the window, bark, bark, bark. You will say the word. The word will have been already taught to them. You don't teach it to them in this procedure. You teach it to them separately. You would say the word, you throw the handful of food. They're gonna come running. They're gonna eat all the food and they're gonna run back to the window, huffing and puffing. They're going to see that the dog is gone. And then they're gonna be like, yeah, there, I scared it away. And then the next time the dog is gonna come by and they're gonna start barking again. They're gonna be like bark, 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 running through the window. Like I really thought Flash was gonna break through the window a few times. Um, and I would say scatter, I would throw the handful of food and then he would come running. Within about less than a week, because I was consistent about it. If I could not be there to train it, he did not have access to the window. Um, as in the window was X penned off and the curtain stayed closed even during the day. Um, so he couldn't see, he couldn't be triggered. That's management, management when you can't be there. And so because I was super consistent with this, every time the, he would bark, he would get food. So eventually what it turned into is he would run to the window, notice a trigger. And for him, it was people, dogs, it didn't matter. Cars, it did not matter. A squirrel, the leaf blew, a shadow, it didn't matter. So he would run to the window and then he would start running to me before he would even bark. He wouldn't bark. He'd be like, okay, the thing is there, where's my food? So if he runs to the window and runs to me, he gets food. I don't care. He gets food. Bam. Scatter. Here you go. Here's your pile of food. Thank you for coming to me. And now it looks like this. He looks up from his bed that sits in front of the window. He looks up and then he looks to me. And instead of scattering anymore, now I tell him he's a good boy and I toss him three or four cookies because he can catch them. So now I toss him three or four cookies so I don't have to get up. If I feel like it, I get up and go hand him a scatter on his bed so that he doesn't have to get up because my dogs are spoiled. They are spoiled little rotten kids. If he wants to get up and come get a scatter, that's fine. If I'm too lazy to get up and feed him cookies, that's also fine, then he gets a scatter. Um, so that's what you would do. Please don't worry about reinforcing your dog jumping at the window because your dog's already doing that. Your dog's already being reinforced by the fact that the dog is moving away. Like, you're not going to make the problem worse, I promise. Your dog is already being reinforced. What you're doing is interrupting the behavior and teaching him a new cue. So the new cue is you go to the window and bark, you get food. Pretty soon, because dogs are super smart and they learn how to anticipate really quickly. So pretty soon he's going to be like, I'm going to, like, barking takes too much energy and too much time. I'm going to go to the window and I'm going to continue. I'm going to cut out the barking. I'm just going to do that. And then eventually, they're like, okay, the running to the window, that, that's too much energy. That, I want my food faster. How do I get my food faster? I perk up my ears and I just go straight to mom or dad. Like, that's how we do it. That's how we do it. And that's how, you, how I solve it and how I've solved it successfully for many, many clients. Don't forget the management part. That's important. All right, I got another question here. Um, so Catherine says that she has a three-year-old female pit bull mix um, who's always full of energy. So do you have any tips on how to lower her energy? She's super hyper. And do you have any advice on how to make her not super hyper 24-7? Well, she's super hyper 24-7 and she's unable to settle or take a nap. My first, my honestly, my first tip would be to um, talk to your vet. Talk to your vet. 
because chances are your dog might need some behavior modification meds to help out. Because if your dog is super anxious about everything, generalized anxiety, um, Prozac is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. And all it does is help create bridges in the brain, science, science jargon here and there, um, to allow learning to happen. And it can help dogs who are unable to relax. It'll help them just, you know, relax just a little bit and then they can rest. So dogs that are super high for 24 seven, we often think that we have to exercise them more and more and more in order to meet their exercises, right? We're like, oh my gosh, this dog has so much energy. Let's tire it out. Okay, great. And then you tire them out. After a week, you're going to notice that your dog needs more to tire him out because you've just built an athlete. You've met his needs. And just like any bodybuilder, at some point, you're going to have to increase weight to increase the gains. Um, that's kind of what's happening with your dog here. So you're going to exercise too much, and then you're going to uh, develop a higher need for more exercise. And then you just create an endurance athlete, and then you can't keep up, and it sucks. So instead, you want to teach your dog how to relax. Teach your dog how to sleep. Those enrichment toys, a lot of those chewy toys, licky mats. I have a licky mat on the um, floor next to my bed here that this puppy was uh, licking at, at at the beginning of all of this before y'all signed on. She licked it too fast. Next time I will freeze it to make it a little bit more difficult for her to consume very quickly and it'll, she it will have to take more time. Those kinds of things will help tire their brain out. And when they have a tired brain, they're just gonna go, oh boy, I need a nap. So things like that. You want to introduce puzzle toys slowly because a lot of dogs, if they don't know what a puzzle toy is, they're going to be like, this is too hard. I'm not doing this. This is stupid. And we don't want them to give up on their puzzle toys. So we start with super easy ones. She doesn't get frozen puzzle toys yet because she doesn't know what puzzle toys even are. But today I learned that she can handle a partially frozen one. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to take her breakfast and I'm going to put it on the licky mat and I'm going to freeze it. Sorry, not her breakfast, her dinner. Um, in the morning, I'm going to take it out of the freezer and put it in the fridge so that it thaws very, very slowly so that it's partially frozen right around dinner time, which is six. So that'll be perfect timing. And then she can have that for dinner and she can just munch on it. And that will help lower her arousal and hopefully help her learn to become around my cats. <sighs> um, and then also hire a trainer to help you through the rest of it but meet her enrichment needs and teach her how to relax. Like a pro trainer will help you through those steps. And yes, I can be that pro trainer. Um, will I come to Newburyport? Um, it depends. <laughs> it depends on how often I'm coming to Newburyport. Um, I do a lot of virtual lessons as well, but yeah, I'm more than happy to come to Newburyport every so often, um, uh, especially for in, in initial consults and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Adam, thank you. This was really terrific. I think everybody got a lot out of it. And um, I'd love to repeat it again. I'm sure I'm sure we're going to have people who missed it who would like to see this again. So we'll definitely. Oh, heck yeah. Anytime. <laughs>